Welcome, everyone, to another edition of Why It Matters. Uh, my name is Tracy Kronzak. I'm the Director of Innovation here at Now It Matters. And I think the best way that I can describe these episodes are, let us take you on a very special Why It Matters journey. Uh, so I'm here to introduce my stalwart companion, Tim Lockie who we've been recording for a year now, and we've never actually explained why some of these conversations and why some of these moments are super important. So this is part two of our Why It Matters. I get to interview Tim, uh, which is so much better than the profoundly disquieting experience of being interviewed. And, yeah, I'm uh, nervous. It's, it's odd. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm never nervous. Like, this is so easy, but yeah, I'm like... Right, you should be you know, nervous. Like you a, should be. Right before a test or something. <laughs> it is. It's a test of all our listeners to see if they actually give a damn about who we are. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, full disclosure for our listeners, by the way, if I sound super raspy, it is because I have caught my first real, God's honest, non-COVID related cold in a year and a half. Uh, and this sucks. So may you all catch your first cold soon because it really sucks. So <laughs> there you go. Um, I'm going to jump right into it. Tell me, Tim, tell me your full name. Where were you born? And, and, and tell me about your childhood and what 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 that related to as it was you know as it what that relates to as it pertains to where you were born there you go all right <clears throat> my full name is timothy george Lockie. george is after my grandfather who i knew he was a really really interesting guy um i was born in bozeman montana and i'm third generation montanan so um for, for white people in Montana, that's a long way back. Uh, that's a huge thing for Montana too, to be like third or fourth generation yeah. Montana. It really is a thing here. Like, you know, every, everybody's like, when did you get here? And I'm just like, <laughs> like, whatever. Anyway, It explains why they hate Californians so much because we're showing just, up in well, droves. Well, and they were Californians last year, right? <laughs> like that's yeah. the thing that's so crazy. Yeah, anyway. Um, Let's see, born in Bozeman, Montana. I had like, like best childhood ever. Like, you know, when you listen to people and they're like, they've got like a really hard story about their childhood or whatever. I just am like, man, I'm going to lose that contest every time. I like, I've got the world's most incredible parents that, you know, there are, they're actually caring people. They live right next door. Like I live you know, in the house next door to the house that I grew up in. Um, and they still live in that house. They bought it when I was 11 months old. It's on Lindley Place, which is one block long and, you know, uh, two blocks away from the best restaurants in Montana and right across the creek from a park where, you know, the literally the band plays on Tuesday nights at the farmer's market. Like it's so Americana, it's just ridiculous. Um, and so, yep, this is, uh, this is where I grew up. Bozeman, Bozeman was like, uh, is this cute little place. Like when I grew, when I was growing up, I think it was like 30,000 people here or something. And I remember like horses and not often or anything, but horses would sometimes like be on Main Street or, you know, um, and, or, or wagons um, now in tractors and stuff like that. Now it is, very like posh just like turning into the jackson hole of montana hmm. um so and uh i am so in terms of childhood so my my mom is jenny lucky my dad's dave lucky uh, a couple of things that shaped my childhood um my dad lost his business in 1980 or 1979 because of radical inflation 
and um, you know he had just started the business a couple of years before, was doing really well. He was the first uh, first person in Montana to have an excavator, which I think is really cool because I love excavators. I didn't know that about your dad. Yeah, no, he was. <laughs> yeah, he was the snow removal and excavation, and so. Like, you know, among other things you can talk to him about, which is like a whole bunch of conversations. One of them is all about excavating and stories about places in Bozeman that he put in foundations. And it was really interesting. So, um, Okay. I knew your dad was a potter. Uh, I had no yeah. idea about the excavation yeah. stuff. What's hilarious is I've met both your parents and in my mind, your mom is Jenny and your dad is firmly Mr. Lockie. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's really interesting. I wonder why. But, <laughs> I don't he know. He so scares casual. the hell out of me. <laughs> he's like such a casual guy. So, I know, oh, but I can't yeah. take, I can't bring myself to call I him. remember, okay. Yeah. I remember the moment <laughs> that I was like, Tracy and my dad are going to be friends forever. Was when we were at their kitchen table. I know this moment. A couple of years back. And you and Amy and my dad and I were all playing Settlers of Catan. And my dad made some dick move that like, like completely cut you off. Wholly and unnecessary, like, by the way. Yeah, absolutely. No, it was great. It like completely crashed your strategy, ensured you wouldn't win. And I looked over and he's like trying not to smile and be really cool. But he was so proud of himself. And it's just, it was great. <laughs> and I looked over at you and you were like, okay, this guy's human. And that was actually a really good play. And Yep. a little bit of respect and then a lot of laughter after that and uh so i was like okay <laughs> that's uh, right that was, that was fun yep. i i will say this about my parents they they are like i came from an evangelical very conservative patriotic family lot to, <laughs> lot lots there to, to unpack yeah. yeah exactly <laughs> but what i what i'll say is that it it's like, I don't even know how to say this, but it was the good kind. You know what I mean? Like, um, and and after meeting you, befriending you, like a lot of my perspectives in life changed, actually. It's been part of what I love about our friendship is that you've helped me rethink a lot of things. But what was always included in my childhood was a steady stream of hospitality, people that would stay with us from all walks of life, um, whether they were, you know, exchange students from Africa that were coming through, whether they were, you know, there were exchange students that lived with us for a while, there were people that were down and out on their luck that needed a place to go. Um, we just had this steady stream of people that would live and stay with us. And I just thought that was normal, that you just like, as a kid, you would just have guests that stay in your house with you for extended amounts of time. And, and then they come back because they found my parents so welcoming. So they were constantly coming back. So I had a steady stream of uh, influence coming in from this outside outside space that I think was really helpful. Um, and it, that is kind of how my mom and dad are really welcoming and like you, you, you know, right. Um, talk to them um, about anything. So I, I thought that was, that was interesting. So uh, I have an older sister, an older brother and a younger sister. My younger sister is learning disabled. And so I grew up with the sense of protecting her and just like, you know, um, I was around when she was young, retard is the, was officially the appropriate like the word that they said. I know yeah. it's just so crazy to hear that now. Um, and then, you know, then handicapped, then disabled, then challenged, you know, and, and so working through that and being in high school and elementary school with, you know, a, a, a sister who is in the special resource room or special ed room uh, taught me a lot about dignity and you can you can like pick out people that were terrible people just by the way that they would interact with my sister you know um, and so I, I think that helped me develop a sensitivity around people are not what they seem but there are things there are ways that you can find out who they really are and my sister was one of those you can just kind of see who people really are when they're interacting with her She's kind of like the Forrest Gump of Bozeman too. Like everybody in Bozeman knows Becky. And, you know, I went from being Josh's brother to Becky's brother and was always like third child syndrome, always like one of the siblings. So um, 
Becky's also hilarious and <laughs> she, she delivers hilarious. things so yeah. deadpan that you're oh, like, yeah. oh, right. that's right. really funny, but oh God, wow. Yeah, yeah. like right. she yeah. is hilarious. Yeah. She's great. Yep. You know. uh, yeah. And yeah, she is really great. Um, and living next to her, you know, after we moved back from San Francisco, living next to her, I just have a whole new appreciation for um for for her willingness to embrace joy when there's a lot of hardship in her life and she just like shakes it off um and so uh and it, that's not it's not like it isn't easy and not effort for her to do that but she chooses to and again i think that's a credit to my mom and dad i think the way that they um that they raised all of us but the way they looked after becky was really really um it shaped how i look at parenting as well what i get the sense of from your mom and dad in particular is and i think this because wasn't becky working at the museum of the rockies at some point am i imagining that I was she working that. there okay she was working somewhere when i met her like a couple of years ago when you know travel <laughs> yeah right exactly. <laughs> travel yeah. um but I felt like she was working somewhere, but like her sense of like, I'm working somewhere was just yep. very Parties. grounded. Yeah, yeah. that's what it was. Yeah. <laughs> I will say <laughs> Lockheed's work. Like, yeah, that is like, that is one of the things that I grew up with is that, you know, you, you know, you, you get up and you help um, and, you know, work is um, like anything besides useless is, was one of the kind of stigmas I had to overcome in, for myself was realizing like there are boundaries to the benefits on that. And there's some times where not working is actually really important and people's worth actually needs to have a different indicator than just, are they capable of doing X and are they willing of doing it? So, um, but yeah, no, Becky worked at Fuddruckers for years, I think 14 years or something and is at Arby's now and um, yeah. Yeah. And there was, there was never like a question of like, you shouldn't be doing this or you can't do this. It's just like, yeah, yeah you're doing yeah, it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say one other facet of um, growing up in my family is that I, I was a religious zealot. So like I was that. Oh, I so want to in dig into school. that. It is so good that you and I did not know each other until much, <laughs> much later in life. Tracy, like you, like, <laughs> I, yeah, I am, I am in so many ways ashamed of how I thought one would go about being a good person and instead accomplish the exact opposite in, in many, many cases. I, I will say this, I was absolutely sincere and I did not, I was not mostly a jerk about it all. I really was mostly out to care for people that just came with a whole flood of privilege and, you know, invisibility about what it felt like on the other side that I did not realize until uh, later in life. Um, but it was earnest and um, maybe not well executed, um, but it also wasn't hypocritical. And, yeah. you know, and, yeah. I, and I think that that, you know, so I didn't, I didn't, I didn't drink in high school. Um, and I'm really glad. In fact, I made a decision never to drink when I was 12 years old uh, after seeing one, one sober of my person in the room says, What? Right. Yeah, right. Well, and what? it's interesting. I do think, like, I, I absolutely feel like I'm an alcoholic that just never started. <clears throat> so I, I, so many times in life, I'm like, I, I completely dodged a bullet on that. So, um, yeah, so I grew up in Bozeman. I was here till I was 18, graduated. I ran track, cross country, did swim team one year because there was a girl in Billings that I wanted to go see at swim meets. Uh, then I found out there was only one swim meet. It was totally <laughs> not worth it. I tried to get out of it. My mom was not happy for it. So. Uh, I learned to play the piano because I figured out at, uh, at a Bible camp that chicks really loved piano. So I was like, I'm going to learn that and did. And so I'm Actually, one of the things people don't know about me probably is I can play piano pretty well. Um, and and almost it's easy for me to pick up instruments. So I play drums. Mm -hmm. I learned accordion for a while, which is very nerdy and uh, will never happen. Did you again. learn and accordion from Weird Al Yankovic? 
I did not, although I did go to, like, Weird Al came to Bozeman, and I did go to one of his concerts, <laughs> and if you think Weird Al is weird, oh, you yeah. don't see nothing until you've seen his fans, like, that, oh. like, oh, yeah, so that was, that was real stuff, um, so. Well, uh, that okay. Was, that, that's my childhood. Yeah. <clears throat> so here's a question that's a follow-up and, and a pivot to the, the format we've been using for this, and that is, faith for you is huge right and you know we only touched on at the end of my interview you're like oh by the way tracy you're ordained in the temple of isis and so on and so forth and i'm like yeah but i've talked about that an awful lot but i think what's interesting about it is faith is huge for me too it's just not the faith everybody assumes should be faith right but but you actually grew up in the faith that everybody assumes should be faith to the point. And I don't know if you still are, cause I, you know, travel, but like, you know, you will still wear your, your evangelical uh, silver ring with, with the fish on it. Right. And I know that has meaning to you. Uh, and I, and I think that's a really interesting topic to dig in on because Everything that you are challenges the precepts of, of that foundation that was built. Yeah. Wow. There's a lot of content there. What, what I can say is um, when I was just graduated high school or just before, I can't remember which, um, I really started to, I read the Sermon on the Mount and thought Jesus meant it, right? And um, there's some stuff in there that is just whack compared to the way that evangelicals especially live. And so I remember talking to uh, a pastor at the time about that. He's like, okay, are we really supposed to be nonviolent? No, that's metaphor. Really, that's interesting because this is like, in a Roman occupied state, a peasant is saying, like, we should be nonviolent. Like, that's a, that's like, if there's a moment to be violent, it is that, you know, and in the long that's history. That's pretty of, radical. Yeah, exactly. And then the Beatitudes, blessed are the meek, like, I, like that, that just doesn't fit. Um, don't store up treasures on earth. Like, like okay so what about all these savings accounts and second homes and you know and my family so just to be really clear and i didn't i didn't even think to mention this we got i grew up privileged but poor like like um when my dad lost the excavating business uh he lost his means of income he uh he became a potter of all things and so there were you know for a for all of my high school and until after high school my parents really were tight money and that meant sometimes like we were going to dumpsters of uh, grocery stores and picking through produce um i don't think they ever ever considered going on food stamps like it just never like crossed their mind but but that we would go and find food that had been tossed out by grocery stores like was like that is part of how we ate um and so i grew up um I grew up without a lot in some ways, but I never, I, I didn't feel like we were a poor family. And I think it was just like my brother did and, and I could see the evidence of it. It just didn't strike me that way. But when I saw, when I started reading it about Jesus, like, give, don't, like, if you've got two shirts, give one away. And like, that was so radically different than all of these rich people I was at church with. It just did not connect. And I remember asking church leaders all over the place. And until I met Jenny's dad, I did not have a sufficient answer to that, which is part of how I met Jenny's dad. Um, was, so my wife is Jenny. So for those of you that are listening in, um, yes, my mom and my wife have the same first name. Um, There's a lot to dig in on that. I know, exactly. It's so <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I, I just, I, I can sum up by saying like, I just did not, I didn't stop asking really tough questions, which led me out of an unloving, uncaring version 
of faith and towards a very different expression of it. Um, mm-hmm. And that that learning has not stopped. That learning is constantly, you know, engaged for me. And I feel like I still learn a lot about what that means. But um, yeah, I think I think yeah that so. My faith is still important to me. My, the fish ring that you're talking about, that's my wedding ring. So I will hopefully always wear it. Is it? I thought yeah. that was on your right hand. That's your wedding yeah. ring. Yeah. Uh-huh. I, um, you know what? I just didn't place that on the right hand yeah, in my head. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think the surprising thing about my faith is that I still have some of it mm. given, given life circumstances and the, uh, uh, in extremely embarrassing ways that the evangelical church, um, who are my people, my tribe, um, and I really, have, I struggle to identify with them, but I feel like it's important to, um, because I, I, I want to call us to be better. So, hmm. but yeah, I think that, I think a lot of people would be surprised to find out that I'm evangelical. Which it's weird. Cause I've kind of always known that, um, but it's always been an abstraction to me, uh, you know, because I, I grew up Christian, obviously, like a lot of us did, unless you grew up Jewish. Um, like that was really the only two options in the Northeast. Right. So like, you know, it, it's just always like been like that abstraction. I, you know, that I knew about with you. Um, yeah. So, I mean, all right. Just like to put that into perspective, like I had hundreds of scriptures memorized i like dug in and read the bible every year i like went to camps all, like i was in it in it like very in it so i actually um, have a chunks of the bible memorized but it oh, was really? much more of a defensive measure like it, that's not a bad you know. call actually yeah i think that would totally make sense yeah because i was always like i don't know if you ever saw that scene in west wing where you know, yeah, it's brilliant. Jeb yeah. Bartlett he, just shuts somebody Leviticus. down. Yeah, right, he pulls yeah, out Leviticus right. and he's like, right. how much would my daughter get on the open market? Yeah. Oh my you gosh. know, like yeah. that kind of right. stuff, right? Like I've always yeah. had that kind of defensively memorized. When we stone so-and-so at the city gates, am I supposed to have two witnesses or four? Like, yeah, that scene is just, it is a great scene. Yeah, yeah. Really good. All right, so how does this connect? Because one of the questions we've asked each other are, are what are three moments in your life? Three like real transformational moments. Yeah. Like, so um, one of the key moments for me, um, and I've got to set the stage here for a minute on this, but I'll sum it up and say, I met a homeless guy who changed my life. Hmm. And the way I met this homeless guy is that, uh, and this is an example of how my parents were, um, my dad was a potter and went, uh, took, you know, pottery on the road. We went to LA and he was driving in LA. My dad is not an artist. He's not, he, I mean, he is, a, he's a craftsman. He's very skilled. Um, but very also Montana and rancher Montana, you know? Um, and so he, he was driving in LA and noticed, I think on the Santa Monica freeway, he, he noticed the extreme poverty and extreme wealth blocks away from each other. Yeah, and, which is that um, area of LA very well. Exactly. Yep. All right. Yep. And um, and so he um, he got to thinking about how his kids did not have any view of that part of the world and what that looked like. And so he thought to himself, for spring break, instead of going and vacationing, wouldn't it be cool to take my family someplace where they could help out, uh, help, help somehow, and also learn about what it's like in the inner city, right? So, um, so he called Focus on the Family, I kid you not, called Focus on the Family <laughs> to ask me. You ask this is super talked, interesting. I know, okay. I don't think he talked to James Dobson, but who right. he called focus on the family and they directed him to the Harambe Center in Pasadena. I don't think okay. it's still or, around. But the Harambe Center was um was uh, part of a family um uh, a guy named John Perkins had started it. John Perkins is a civil rights activist and 
Uh, and we went and stayed with the Perkins family and did tutoring and uh, like mowed, mowed their lawns and painted some stuff in, in the compound that they lived in. And we're very, <laughs> very, very white rural folk in Pasadena in the mid eighties. And, you know, uh, it, it was a, it was a really important learning experience for me, uh, really transformative. And my dad came back and told other people in the church about it. And it was like, we helped this out, but mostly we learned so much and got to see a different side of life and it was good for our kids. So the next year, 30 people went on this mission to the Denver Street School um, and went and just did construction and helped, um, you know, helped build these buildings or remodel these buildings for a week. Um, and, and did that for the next, I think, two decades, Spring Break Missions became a thing in Bozeman. And there were hundreds of people that would go on these trips uh, by the time they, they got spun up. And, and I wanna say like, this was actually a, an element of service projects that were done really well for places like the Union Gospel Mission in Seattle and you know Spokane and all these kinds of places. Anyway, we were doing this kind of work and um, in the Denver Street School, um, there was, there was a guy that kept wandering around. His name was Joseph. He was a homeless guy. And for whatever reason, Joseph and I got to be friends. And I want to say it, that Joseph picked me out of like all these other, other people around and kind of was like my bud. Um, hmm. He's not a dangerous homeless person. Um, you know, uh, he, would, he would make inappropriate comments to women. So like, you know, he was also like, you know, inappropriate at times. Um, but he, but he really, uh, he and I got to be friends. I talked with him for, you know, every day we would hang out. Um, and, you know, uh, and then the last day that we were there, he gave me this fake Rolex watch, you know, um, which I proudly wore to my prom. And it was like a real prized possession because it was the, it, it was shocking to me to go up to a place and think I was there to serve others and do something good for other people and then realized that this homeless guy gave something to me and it just reversed my view of poverty mm. and I remember telling my mom like my mom was like homeless people are lazy and you know um, don't don't work hard and and I was like well I don't know that that's the case but I I do know a homeless person named Joseph and and that's different for me like um Joseph is doing like he's making different career choices, but he's not a, a morally bankrupt person just because he is homeless. And it created it created such a distinct moment in my mind around what poverty is and that there's poverty and there are poor people. And that this is about this should be about people, not problems. And um, and so that 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 shifted me from whatever it was, you know, I, I think it was 16 at the time and I wanted to do, I don't even know what I wanted to do, but it, it channeled me towards, I want to work um, with, home, with poor people, um, people in poverty that in a way that is mutual. And I didn't even have the language for what that meant. I just, I just knew that that was what was important to me. And, that, and then I, I did that um, after high school. That meant that instead of going to college, um, I went and lived at a halfway house in the only urban place in Montana that I could find and, um, and lived in this, in this halfway house for, and, and ran it, managed this halfway house for a couple of years, uh, did youth work for uh, ministry and, um, in Billings. And, and a lot of that was just around like, how do I, how do I align my people, myself with the have nots instead of the haves? How do I live on the wrong side of the tracks? And that, that became really important to me um, to identify at, you know, at the place that I live and the way that I live with the have nots instead of the haves just became really important. Um, um, so that was a key moment for me. Did you ever, now I know that you have kept tabs on and are still friends with some of the folks from that halfway house day, <clears throat> but did you ever keep tabs on Joseph? Like, did you find out what happened to him? You know, it's so funny you ask that. Um, 
I later went on to work for a missionary organization, which is where I was working when I started working in Salesforce. And so, um, and um, one of the things we did was we, um, we started an internship on a new, a new site in Denver. And we worked with the, the founder of Denver Street School, his name is Jeff Johnson. And I told Jeff Johnson, you know, way back when you would not remember me from Adam. Um, but I came and I met this guy named Joseph and it was really interesting. And, um, and then I flew in several times to Denver to check on my team and lead them and stuff and, and got to be friends with Jeff Johnson. And one of the times I flew in, Jeff was like, hey, I want you to go for a ride with me. So I hopped in the car and we went someplace and pulled up and knocked on the door and there was Joseph. Uh, so he knew Joseph. Yeah. And so I was like, this is holy great. cow. So, I know. Yeah. He didn't have an email or phone or anything like that. So uh, I was, uh, and, and so the next time I was in town, I was like, Joseph, let's go to lunch anywhere you want to go. Like, we'll go there. And he wanted to go to the Burger King that was part of a gas station. So okay. that's where we went to lunch and exactly. Yeah, it was fine. Um, so yeah, uh, I did, uh, it, it felt full circle. In fact, a lot of the places I did that work, I would end up in uh, like across the street from the gospel mission or, you know, that I worked with in Seattle. Um, so I remember having a conversation with Dave Averill and looking out the window and seeing that mission because it's across from the innovation hub in Seattle. And, uh, and so, yeah, um, I, I don't, I think that I have not kept up with very many of them. And I think that that is uh, the nature of some of that work. And also I'm kind of bad at keeping up with people in general. So, um, but yeah, no, I, he, he was doing fine um, living inside, which was, which was really great. But yeah, we've had, um, Jenny and I, we had homeless people live with us. Uh, the most expensive homeless person in San Francisco was a friend of ours, um, you know, before he got into treatment. Um, and and m- most of my homeless friends never escaped that life. And that wasn't yeah. the point. And, right. and that, that was really the defining line for me. I wasn't out to turn Joseph into a Christian. I wasn't out to get him off of alcohol, which I'm pretty sure he was on. Um, I wasn't out to get him living in different how I was out like I wasn't there to do anything except know this person and like help if I could but mostly just to be a friend to who they were um and that that was really different than a lot of the other ways that Christians I felt like engaged people in poverty they just didn't see people they saw problems and I really disliked that so that's interesting because it's also from where I'm sitting like an introduction to systems thinking in other words you know there's a short-term goal of convert this person put a roof over their head do this do that right right? but there's this long-term system of power privilege access health care all of these things that come together and put that person where they are and sometimes it's escapable and sometimes it's not And, you know, from outside looking in, it seems like what you were actually questioning was, are we treating the problems or are we just treating the symptoms? I, yeah, absolutely. Um, Wow, there's so much content there. It challenged, it really, at points that became a crisis for me, like there isn't that much that we can do. And so I found, I found that shortly after meeting Joseph, that exact question kept bugging me so much uh, until until I really got my head around the central theme of my faith is that God loves us. And that his request is that we do so to others. And that's it. Um, And and it didn't need to get more complicated than that. Uh, I didn't... I, I didn't need to fix anybody. Um, and, uh, and I also, and the thing that makes that possible is the sense that we are actually created in, um, in the image of something holy and that makes us part holy and that we are able to give and receive love because of that. And so in real moments of questioning my faith, all of you know what happens with baptism like falls away and you know is is my friend tracy who 
worships ISIS, which is idolatry. Is that a big deal for me? Not really. Idolator, um, guilty. And, right, exactly. <laughs> and uh, and that's because um, because God loves Tracy, and it's not that complicated. Um, and that has allowed me to be cross cultural. Yeah. I think in ways that stymied me before I got my head around that, where I was like, I like okay, I, I'm supposed to like get this person to do whatever. And, um, and I think a lot of that just relaxed into my job here is to care for this person and, and to love them. And it's not more, and that's challenging enough without introducing anything else. And once you introduce that, a lot of secondary issues start up. Um, a lot of judgment, a lot of who's right. So, you know, like, you know, um, so yeah, I found a lot of power in the idea that we're supposed to love our neighbor. Well, so it's really interesting to me, at least. And then I want to hear about two more times in your world. And that is you made a comment to me after this whole Texas thing went down. About, you know, this is it's pulling you in two directions, how you were raised and how you see the world. You know, and I just think Texas abortion. Yeah. Travesty. Yeah, right. Yeah, and then you mean, call was, it a travesty at all because, yeah. you know, I think we kibitzed for a few minutes on it and then we had to go do something for the yeah. company or whatever. But like, that was an interesting comment to me that is relevant to this context. Yeah. Um, and it goes back to systems thinking. It goes back to privilege and it goes, you know, um, and, and uh, you know, interestingly enough, I think what happened is I studied economics hmm. and, you know, economics became a secondary pillar for me about human behavior and what people actually believe versus what they say they believe. Um, And what, you know, everybody has faith. The question is, what do they, what do they have faith in? And, um, you know, I, and so, yeah, I, I, I do think that it is a travesty. I don't, you know, I think abortion was a very complicated thing for me uh, because I was raised just with such such a strong mindset against it and was part of that world. And then over time, the issues became much more complicated until, um, and, and, until yeah, I just, I think that we, I don't think the issues are even the issues anymore. It's all symbol now. Hmm. Yeah, I actually would agree with you on that. Yeah. Two more times in your life, not letting yeah, you off the um, hook on this. <laughs> I really don't want to talk about this next one. Um, so I'm, kind of, I'm kind of stalling out on it. Uh, what happened next for me in life is I, I moved to, I kept asking questions and um, found an author that, that wrote about, like the first author I met that was uh, the evangelical left. And actually this guy started Evangelicals for Social Action was part of very advanced progressive thinking that came out in the 60s and then just kind of like got, uh, or in the 80s, sorry, and just kind of got stifled um, for years and years. Um, And uh, so I had the opportunity to go and learn from and be mentored by um, by this guy's name was John Alexander. And he lived in a community in San Francisco. And so this Montana kid went to San Francisco for the summer uh, in, was it 96? And um, I had sworn off dating for a while. I was calling it lack the Mac. So I was lacking the Mac. Um, and uh, I was telling some people about that. And then um, John's daughter came in and told one of them that they had a phone call. And I was like, oh, she's really cute. Um, so then later I married her and that's my wife, Jenny. And uh, really fell in love that summer. Um, and it became very hard not to date. Um, so I, um, and I learned a lot from this community. This community was, um, I don't know how, I, I don't know how to put this into words, but I spent the next 13 years in this community learning about a way of doing life that was an alternative to uh, almost, you know, uh, to a lot, of, uh, a lot of ways that we do life. So, um, there were about 40 of us. We shared four houses. We shared meals together. Um, did not share wives. 
<laughs> for example. I was um, waiting for that. I know, I these are the juicy details. Like you know, where it goes. Yeah. I um, was like, these are the super yeah. juicy details yeah. that yeah. differentiate, yeah. Uh, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. You right. know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and in the in the intentional community world, like it is a it is a really interesting world um, that combines high ideals and a ways of living um, living out your faith that are very genuine uh, and pretty hardcore, um, but not militant the way that a lot of uh, some of the newer evangelical things feel. Is it was a lot uh, more progressive. Um, and it comes out of the peace movement. So uh, it's, it's worth saying, like the like the Quakers and the Anabaptists, if you're familiar, like they sure. keep getting it right. Like they got it right with civil rights. They got it right with, you know, uh, with abolition. Like there's a strife that gets it right. And we all basically ignore them because they are out of alignment with most of our self-interests. So anyway, I, I lived at this community for um, 13 years. Jenny's dad died early on um, and he was the leader. And then that, uh, another guy died. Um, who was the second leader, and then it kind of just turned into Animal Farm. Uh, over mm. time. And I, I mean, I'm still like, I'm as I'm talking about this, uh, just so that you know the kind of power that this community had. I'm like so worried that people from that community would be listening in and um, and judge me for you know the story I'm about to tell here, uh, because there was so much power uh, in in that community, um, and things got things got bad at that community for me in particular. Um, and they got so bad that eventually um, I tried to take my life. Um, and uh, it w I would not classify it as a very serious attempt. Um, you know, I, I, I was gonna jump off the Golden Gate Bridge um, and my therapist called me um, and asked, um, could tell something was wrong, asked what was going on and made me promise I would call my wife and tell her. Um, I think my therapist was really smart to know not to call the police because I would have been instantly arrested and it would have been really horrific. Um, but my wife um, drove and picked me up um, and I think really saved my life. And that's important because my wife and I have not had like we have not had a photo photogenic marriage. Like we really struggled. Um, and I'm really proud of our marriage. Like we have a really good marriage, I think, but it was not easy. Um, and at the time that this happened, things were, things had been rocky between us, um, largely because of this community. And um, so um, we, um, so that was a key moment in my life. <laughs> um, and I don't, I feel like I'm supposed to have some lessons from that. And, um, and I, I don't know that I do, except that I'm much more aware of how important uh, mental health is and how much belonging controls us in ways that we don't really even know or understand. Um, and how um, weird it is that a community dedicated to caring for one another unintentionally created that much mental anguish for me that that felt like the only way out um so um that was a that was a key moment number two i can only speak from my own experiences in this world but having been also on that brink at one point in my life also related to the golden gate bridge what I can say is, for me at least, there was a feeling of like absolute and perfect calm. Like this is the most rational thing to do given all the options that we've weighed. We have thought this through again and again, and now I'm completely at peace. And now I am completely calm and okay with this decision. Was it was it kind of like that for you as well? Oh, that is, uh, yeah, that's surprisingly accurate. Um, I, I think for both you and I, we love like there's nothing better than having a problem to solve. Like yeah, just that's love right. It. Uh, and I think for about three years, 
there had been an unsolvable problem with this community. And one morning in a meeting, it hit me that this was a solution. And a lot of the problem was people in this community didn't believe things were as bad for me as they were. And what I realized is they, they would either get it or I would be gone and it wouldn't matter. I, I, looking back, like that is just insanity. Like looking back now, I was, I, I, it just makes no sense, but exactly what you're saying. Like what I realized is I didn't even need to be like unscared of that process. I just yeah. needed 30, 30 seconds of bravery to get up over the edge of a bridge is all it would take to solve that. And I was like, I could muster, I can muster 30 seconds of overcoming that fear. Um, and it became an instant solution. And yeah, it became, um, it just, it was a way out. It felt, and that felt like such a relief uh, that felt good. Actually, I walked um, across San Francisco and got to Golden Gate Park. Um, and I used to play in the drum circle pretty frequently. And so, Oh, yeah, I know the one. Sure. Yeah. Um, and so I, and I, I learned uh, djembe and, and other hand drums there and, and, and with that group. Um, so I stayed, I, I stayed there for a couple of hours and drummed. Um, and um, I think that actually saved my life because uh, it, you know, bought me time for when my therapist ended up calling. So. Yeah, it was, uh, there was a, a very clear, like, calm, like, okay, I know what I'm doing. And that, I, it just still feels so weird, but that just, uh, the, like, it had been so long without a way forward that that just felt right. Yeah, it's, like, profoundly relieving. Yeah. You're yeah, like, exactly. oh, my God, I hit on the solution. And it's exactly. so simple. Exactly. Yeah. It's immediate. I can handle it. I can, I can have this done today. And it's um, like, remove thine self from yeah. the equation and the problem yeah. goes yeah. away. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I grew up thinking that suicide was um, a really selfish act. Like, hmm. um, you know, Montana, I would just say, is not a bastion of mental health progressive. So, <laughs> like, I did not know that I was, uh, that I had chronic um, depression, you know, until I was well into my 20s. And I had to figure out insomnia and ADD um, on, you know, on my own in my thirties. And so, you know, um, yeah, I just didn't have a lot of those early tools to assess any of that. Um, well, part of the it, challenge with those challenges is having the language to describe the yes. challenge in the first place. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Yes. And I feel like what happened from that experience is I, the one of the outcomes was that I moved away from the community. Right. Like, um, so a couple months later, Jenny and I moved back to Bozeman. Um, but another outcome is that I got really empathetic uh, about about people's like life choices. Like, hey, like I'd probably do that too. Um, it became just as I, as I would think about what people were up against, it just became more and more clear. Like life is hard and the choices people make um, probably make sense to them. And facing the same option set with low energy and, you know, um, you know if, if I were in that, that context, I would probably do something similar. And um, I, I, think, I think that set me up to be a different, to view life a different way. Um, you met me like, I think a year and a half after that or something. Um, and, and I think that, that that had really shifted who I was mm. and how I experienced things. You also met me when I was at peak PTSD around San Francisco. So going to San Francisco triggered all sorts of PTSD for me um, for years of, in, in the Salesforce ecosystem. You, know, you kind of have to go to mecca, San Francisco, right? right? Yeah, it's to, like you know, there's the Salesforce's mecca and, and the Hajj is dream force. Right, exactly. And yeah. so um, I was there a lot and it was constantly triggering all this stuff for me. Um, and uh, so, yeah, you you might be in San Francisco 
like soon after that. And it was very, very challenging for me to be in San Francisco. So, wow. And to talk about it, like it was also <laughs> in shame about this, like being in a community that had treated me like this for years and that I'd been a part of for so long and still, you know, like had all com all sorts of complicated feelings around that. Um, and then PTSD that turned me into a rageaholic for a couple of years. Um, and um, so, yeah, just, yeah, very challenging. Um, Anger and PTSD are kind of hand in glove, right? Yeah, yep, yeah, they were for me. Yeah, they were for me. Um, so yeah, that was really, that was, um, that was a pivotal time for me. And now it matters really, because um, at the time, like just, of course, you know, you just start layering things in. Um, at the time, one of the um, one of the participants was um, part part of Now It Matters uh, and part of the community, and that you know just created other issues for me as well. And uh, eventually, my therapist was like, "Tim, you need to understand the cognitive dissonance you're trying to hold, where people like in one context mean one thing, in another context mean something else." Like it's become so extreme for you that this is where people split their personality in order to deal with it. And she was like, I feel like you're slipping. And I think like you need to take it seriously that that like your, your mind can only handle so much dissonance before it has to solve it itself. And that was, that was a very real wake up call. That was after, after my attempt and, and so on. So. And I, and we did not immediately decide, like, we did not decide to move after that immediately. Like we, we were like, maybe we can still make this work. Like just crazy um, looking back on it now. So, um, wow. Two of my so, favorite anyway. words, cognitive dissonance, you know, yeah, right. really. Yeah. All yeah, right. Moment I'm, number. Uh, yeah, oh, go yeah. ahead. Oh. I was going to say moment number three. What was that? Um, I think moment number two was key because I came out of that with a life and almost didn't have one. Mm -hmm. um, moment yeah, like, number oh, three, crap. What next? Yeah, yeah, right. Like there are all of these moments in time that are so meaningful that I feel like I should be picking. But um, so like the first time I held my daughter, um, you know, it felt like oh, I'm a dad. Um, first time I held my son. Um, you know, there, you know, when I got married, um, but um, a, a thing happened, um, I think uh, just a couple of years ago um, where, I, you know, you and I had become friends. I had worked at Now It Matters and really had been wanting to learn. Um, you know, at the time we had Cloud TNT, which is a podcast where right, I basically we did. got got introduced to like lesbians who code and was like really uncomfortable and figuring my way forward in that and like, you know, pronouns and figuring that out. Like it was just kind of like the white guy gets schooled every every week with you and Joni and the guest. Um, and so, you know, um, uh, it, I had had some um, preparation and my daughter had come out um, in junior high um, and like I actually, was ready for that because of it. Um, and, you know, all my, all of my, the leaders in my company um, were, were almost all were women at the time. Then one day, Alexina, I was like saying something progressive about something or other, um, you know, and Alexina was like, well, you're sexist. And I was like, no, I'm, no, like, let's be clear here. I'm a white guy that's like figuring out how to, not be the isms and I'm an ally and I've got a sticker to prove it from Salesforce who gave it to me. <laughs> right. um, and so I was about to go into full defensive mode. And in the back of my mind, something just said, shut up, which I listened to because I get that all the time. And you and I just blow right past that. Yeah. Um, it's like, whatever, man. The shut up not, light yeah, is on, but whatever, who exactly. cares? Right. You know, who yeah. cares? It's just the shut uh, up light. It's like check exactly, engine. Right. The what does it really light is mean? Always on. Right. Yeah. Totally. Check yeah. engine's always on. What does right. that mean? Yeah. You know. So uh, but for once I was like, okay, I'm gonna I like thought long enough to be like, okay, this is probably not the right time to be defensive. 
And this is your daughter who is like figuring herself out. Um, and so I like didn't say what I was gonna say about how I am not sexist and instead said, huh, tell me more about that. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and she did. Um, and none of it really felt like it stuck, you know, like, ah, I think she's wrong. But then, um, but I couldn't escape that comment. And I was like, if someone would know, it's my daughter, right? Like, who else is gonna tell me this? Um, and so I just started, like, I started with the assumption that she was right. Like, okay. Um, and, and the more I thought about it, the more I was like, well, how would I not be sexist? I'm a white guy, like, and, and for that matter, how would I not be racist? And also, how would I not be homophobic? And the more I thought about that, the more I was like, how would I not be any, like all of the isms? Like, how, how would I not? Like, um, and it was a conversion experience that was every bit as profound to me as the conversion experience of faith uh, to be a Christian was for me, um, where it, you know, which is supposed to include, I'm really screwed up and there's nothing I can do about it. Um, and like acceptance of that and, you know, grace that comes from that um, should have prepared all of us, evangelical Christians, for a moment of reckoning like, okay, of course we're screwed up. And of course we are, you know, isms. Um, but I had not really, I just had not had to Think about that that way until my daughter said that um and so for the next i'd say for the next few years and still now today um i engaged the conversation around that with the assumption that i was probably and that that did not disqualify me as a legitimate human worthy of care and food and you know um and that that really shifted my view of me as like, I'm not the good guy here. Like, I'm like, I'm not, like, I'm not the good guy um, any more than I'm the bad guy, right? I was going like, to say, but you're not the bad guy that. either. You're, you're just exactly. a dude. Exactly. I'm a, I'm a guy, right? <laughs> and I'm a guy that grew up a certain way and with a lot of privilege. And the more, the more I started to get my head around, and I had a lot of conversations with Shauna Hughes about this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and, you know, um, especially like growing up poor, but privileged, um, you know, I remember having dinner with Shauna Hughes in Ryan Osnack one time and laughing so hard about car stories where Shauna was telling me about car breakdown stories and I was telling her about car breakdown stories. And when we got to the, when we got to the story where Shauna had like a family member that had tied strings to the end of the windshield wipers in a rainstorm it was like pulling the wipers from side to side in the middle of this restaurant we were laughing so hard like people were starting it was it was amazing um but I, I i realized like um there was an inescapable piece of privilege mm. to me that i just needed to understand and accept and be okay with um and or i was never gonna or i was always gonna live in defensive mode like, no, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not sexist. Um, and everything changed when I just started saying, yeah, I probably am sexist. And yeah, I, I'm, I know I'm homophobic. I mean, I try not to be in my daughter's gay. And, um, and yet, like, there are traces of that in my background that just make that challenging. And I would say a lot of that's faded. I don't think it'll ever go away, you know. Um, and, and I also feel like, remember, um, we had Ashima one time and uh, on Cloud TNT and Ashma said, the reason that justice works is that people have lifespans and they yeah, die that's and right. new people. And, make and space. I was just like, that's that right. is so, that is such a crazy different view of justice. Um, so I, I would say that was a key moment for me was just coming face to face with privilege, accepting it and realizing, wow, I like I've accepted that I'm some, I, I, I am sexist and that, like hasn't broken me or my sense that I'm still an okay human. Um, and that, and I didn't, I'm not complacent about that. I, you know, I started looking at what, what I could do as a leader and how I can use my privilege on behalf of others. But it all started with that privilege. And I remember relating it to economics um, and thinking um, an asset is something that you own 
and it's something that you can do something with. So if you want privilege to be an asset that you can use on behalf of others, you want to view it as an asset that is a way that you can help other people, then you have to own it. And that ownership has to like literally be like, this is my privilege. And so I can do something with it. And the more that you pretend you don't have it, the less accessible it is. You, are, you intentionally keep it invisible and that it can never be used on behalf of others. And I don't think I like do that well at it, but it is, um, it is important to me. And, and DEI is a real thing um, for me. And um, so, and you've been around for a lot of that journey and you've seen that. And, well, and what I also think is fascinating <clears throat> is that this connects to some of the contemporary, you know, culture war stuff, right? Like, I swear there is somewhere in, in, in the left, and I haven't found who it is yet, but there's like an anti-PR machine. Because what you are talking about is the foundation of what is called critical race theory, right? It's the idea that we examine our privilege as it relates to others, and we understand how that represents itself along many different lines, notably race and ethnicity, because of the history of this country and what all of that represents. But the way that it gets picked up and talked about is not how you described it, right? It's like defund the police. Again, this is not about you know, you know taking money away. This is about changing priority and putting the right resources in the right places. Picking up, you know, with privilege. Okay, we we have to move to other fun topics. Well, one one thing to say know? about that really quickly is a a serious frustration that I have is so I think it's interesting. You look at the left, I look at the right. Um, because that's my people. That's where yeah. I come from. The left is my and, people. It's where I come from. That's right. Right. And it should be so simple. Like we have all of the apparatus to just be like, hey, like if you identify as a Christian, then it means that you're like already good with the idea that you're not perfect. So like how like how can this be that big of a struggle to recognize that you probably have like you were embedded in these systems that create this kind of a background for you um but hard uh, so i'm uh, yeah um because it's ego yeah, yeah it, the thing that's so weird is that until like they're like i experience a, a high amount of freedom around privilege i don't feel embarrassed about it i don't feel guilty about it i don't like um it from that moment the thing that changed for me is that it was the path to acceptance and then freedom, mm. which is, which has made it really easy to have these conversations for me in a way like we when we inter interviewed um, Dwayne, for example, or Darrell Booker. Um, they, I just don't struggle with a lot the way I used to, um, because it's so much more freeing to just be like, yeah, well, I'm you know I'm a work in progress. And I, I just it's so frustrating to watch that and just be like, look, you can't. You can't sidestep the part where you're like, I'm part of the problem here. So I want to change to be part of the solution. So anyway. Um, yeah. All right. So okay. really, we're, we have one big question and then a bunch of lightning rounds. Uh, any, what would, if you had one do over, would you use it? And what would you use it on? That's such a chain of events question, right? Like, right. I mean, this is multiverse stuff. Yeah, right. No, you know. no, I, I, I wouldn't. I don't think there's anything. No, I would just go back and undo. Because you wouldn't be where you are now if you did. Yeah, I thought about the uh, the other side of that of where I would be otherwise, and there's a. I think sometimes about if I hadn't met Joseph. Mm. That is a like what I want to make sure I would never do is not meet Joseph because it really swung me in a different direction. And I think um like I was headed towards politics and you know I think that I would be a white politician from Montana brokering power in evangelical, like patriotic 
yeah, I think that's you, uh, you'd that's be kind of like the Liz Cheney of Montana, I think, yeah. you know. Probably okay, a lot less power, but yes. well, I mean, you don't know. Yeah. DC is a weird place, man. That's true, yeah. It's funny, I always think of like because I'm a nerd. There was this great story arc in the DC universe called Flashpoint. And like, you know, the Flash suffered with like the death of his father or something like that way on early in his childhood. And when he finally figures out how to time travel, he goes back and stops his father from being killed. And that just like screws everything, everything up. Everything up. Everything. Yeah. Like, yeah so many things right so like that's always like my referential framework and i yep. was like no i i don't i don't want to do that you know right. Yep. all right where would you be if you weren't here now what would you be doing yeah i mean i i do think um i think that there's a good chance that i could i, I could have gone into politics probably right wing um with a really strong, really strong faith that I think now would have been misguided. Um, so uh, yeah, I think I think that's a real possibility um, of of where I could have been. Um, I do call you I, the mayor of Bozeman, even if you're not, because you, you know everybody there. I don't. My family does. I I feel like uh, you, you know, but yes, the Lockies are. <laughs> Where else? Anywhere else, or just politics? I, you know, uh, politics probably. Um, I was really aimed at being a missionary and did a lot of missionary work. And the kind of work that we did, like we looked at, Jenny and I looked at moving into a, a barrio in Venezuela. Um, and like, I remember we were there um, with the family, and we were thinking about moving into this neighborhood. And it was late at night because everything happens late there, and that is a very fall, very fun culture. Um, and, uh, I remember looking over and some guy was running down the street, chasing another guy with a knife and that mm. wasn't that uncommon. So, um, so we, we did think about that for a while. Um, I think, uh, some people counseled us against that. I think that was probably good. You got to know what you're up for. And Jenny and I were not up for that. Um, not up for the late night knife yeah. fights. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. and then since then, I mean, just the, the mess yeah. that, um, that Venezuela was in. Um, I think there are a lot of scenarios in which um, our marriage wouldn't have made it, honestly. Um, so I'm very glad that I am happily married um, and hope my wife is as well. <laughs> um, and there, you know, there was a, there, yeah, I mean, uh, we've been married 22 years and marriage has really formed a lot of who I am. Um, and um, so, there are a lot of scenarios in which I didn't own a business, um, didn't didn't work. I think it's like for anybody that knew me when I was younger, the fact that I'm a CEO is just very odd. Like that is that is not what people saw coming. Uh, I'll say that. So, um, yeah, I, I think those are some of the places that I've been. I I don't know if you know, I was a Wrangler for one summer. So you've mentioned that before yeah yeah that was that was but no way you wouldn't go out on a ranch would you i i mean i come from a long family of ranchers and there's part of that that's true kind of appealing to me um and so yeah i i um i wanted to be a speaker writer author and then felt like you know what helping on profits with data is actually my my gig so yeah all right those are some of the things let me see here. I think we have lightning round uh, mm. for you. God, what would what would what would even be? All right, let's do the easy ones. Favorite color? Blue. Yeah, I figured you were a blue person. Yeah. Favorite movie? Casablanca, Spaceballs, or Galaxy Quest? Galaxy Quest, widely acknowledged as the best Star Trek movie ever oh, made. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was kind of hoping you'd say Condor Man, though. No, not God. <laughs> Although I keep, like, my kids now like it so much that they keep forcing other people to watch it. Condor Man! Yeah. Oh, my God. I did recently so learn, okay, so uh, Condor Man had a budget of $14 million and it, like, lost $9.5 Like, it was, like, 
So, or maybe it maybe it was only five. I can't remember, but it was a lot. Like it was a big loss for them. So, so basically, Clan Locky is essentially supporting right. all the royalties on that exactly. film. Exactly. Yeah. At this point, like <laughs> we're the uh, we're the only ones searching Disney Plus for Condor Man. So, yeah. Do you know there were different versions of that film? Like, no. there's different what? edits. There's a couple of different no. edits with very mild differences. Yeah. Huh. You have to, I, I forget where I discovered this, but there is, it's not substantive, but there are a How couple of. this? Like what? We I, watched Because you were like, year, let's we watch this it? crazy movie. And so I was like. researched it? Like, yeah. That is so, that is so uh, and there's actually somewhere else in either the DC or one of the properties. It's not DC, obviously, because if Disney owns it, but there is some weird shout out to condor man in in other disney properties yeah no way yeah oh, i can't crazy. remember what it was but it was like i went down the condor man rabbit hole for about 45 minutes and then i was like okay we're done we can't go down that's this all, rabbit hole there isn't more than you that. know it is you know? the least efficient like defection in cold war history like just absolutely no like no explanation for any of the craziness that was just like let's get one person out of a country this could be easy but no like well so. you know the equivalent is like we're going to give you a tricycle a rocket launcher a scuba mask and a hot air balloon and good luck right. and yeah, you're like totally. but yeah what like none of that like <laughs> none of that fits yeah. together none of, none of that needs to happen so yeah <laughs> um all right what makes you happy um Talking, talking with people yeah. makes me genuinely happy. I, I, it's one of the reasons I like why it matters so much. Um, yeah. Yep. What makes you sad? What's happening in Afghanistan? Uh, yeah. I cannot. Uh, I, I did, I, I did some studies on Afghanistan pre-Taliban. Well, no, pre-9/11. Um, and um, it has just been really sad to watch. Yeah. Favorite baked good? Uh, uh, wow, donuts. I'm yeah, really. Donuts. Yeah, I just love donuts. <laughs> Do you have like any particular brand, or is it just all? I mean, it's not even like it's not even the good stuff. I'm like you know those little you know donuts that you get at yeah. at, at like gas stations. Like I'm oh my god. Oh yeah, no, no, no. I, I'm like, you know, white trash donuts. I'm I'm up for that. Uh, in San Francisco, like they had like these like balsamic vinegar with bacon yeah. crumble, whatever donuts. I'm like, no, that is not a donut. I don't know what that is. It's like weird. I just like hand me a glaze. Okay, and then Krispy Kremes is a whole like next oh, level. Yeah, no. They're giving out free donuts to vaccinated people all month. Like Where? the whole everywhere, everywhere Krispy Kreme has a store. So you, you go to the store and you're like, here's my fully vaccinated card. And they're like, congratulations. Here's your so donut. Then, you can come back tomorrow and do the same thing. No way. That's yeah, awesome. way. Yep. Wow. Yep. It's a good thing there are not any Krispy Kremes within five hours. <laughs> there was a Simpsons Treehouse of Horror. Do you remember this one where, where no. Homer, Homer was like in hell and the, and the, and like they dragged him into a room. And there was like one of these little demons. He was like, you're going to do nothing but eat donuts. And he's like, no, no, no. And it cuts to like six hours later and Homer's six times the size that he was. And he's still eating donuts. Still going. And the, and the, and like the demons is like totally perplexed. He's yeah. like, you know, you're supposed to hate this by now. Yeah. <laughs> yep. um, yeah. No, that's how I feel about pizza though. Really. I get it. Like, oh yeah. New York yeah, pizza is a very specific thing. Chicago pizza is a very specific thing. And, and what we have done with pizza out here on the West coast is a very specific kind of personal horror. You know, it really uh, is. Yeah, And then if you go to Italy, which you did oh, recently, yeah. and you have pizza there. It's just like, there's no coming back. No, like, no, just it's, it ruins. You. It, it ruins yeah. Pizza. I'm ruined. Yeah. It was yeah, good. Totally. Uh, all right. Any, any parting thoughts for our guests? No, thanks. Uh, it's it's genuinely interesting to rethread some of the pieces of my life. You just don't go back into the storerooms and check those things out all the time. And um, no, you and know, it's, it's good to remember 
why you are who you are. Um, and it's also, I'm really glad to have talked with you about your life as well uh, in, in the other interview. It's just, there's just so much that goes into who we become. And, um, yeah. and it's all just, you just don't know. It's just so hidden. And it's like, why do we do what we do? Why is this even a priority? Yeah, exactly. yeah. 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 Cool. Well, thanks, Tim. Thank you. I'm Tim Lockie. I'm Tracy Kronzak. And you've been listening to Why It Matters. Why It Matters is a thought leadership project of Now It Matters, a strategic services firm offering advising and guiding to nonprofit and social impact organizations. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe, check out our playlists, and visit us at nowitmatters.com to learn more about us.